All right, well, I'd like to read for you Matthew 26, verses 31 through 35. And, you know, it's interesting that I don't think uh, Brooks actually used this passage, but I, I think it's a great example of what it is that he is um, teaching us this morning from this particular point, which again is, and the title, uh, don't forget, is um, Satan's Lie, okay? Others may fall, but you won't, okay? That, that's Satan's lie. Um, and I think we see a great example of that in this passage. So I am going to spend the first part of the sermon just kind of looking at this example of Peter and what's behind all of this, uh, uh, you know, why he, he fell into the snare in the first place and perhaps what he might have done uh, to avoid it, humanly speaking. So we read beginning in verse 31, Then Jesus said to them, to his disciples, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding, to our understanding this morning. Well, again, in our passage, we know Jesus has just finished celebrating the Passover with his disciples, where he gave new significance to the bread and to the cup. And this is perhaps you know, good to get us sort of thinking this direction because here is the only reason why we are delivered, of course, from destruction, but also from temptation and sin. Now, we know our Lord Jesus on that occasion, instead of its, um, you know, uh, being a memorial from this point forward of the Lord's deliverance of his people from Egypt through Moses, he said now it would serve to remind them, to remind us of our redemption from the kingdom of darkness. Again, not just, you know, the consequences of those things, but even the, the power of those things. Jesus was reminding them that he was about to lay down his life on the cross to deliver us from the power of the devil and to bring us safely into his family and into his kingdom forever. So here is a picture of our deliverance from the very things that we are uh, considering this morning. Now, as Matthew goes on, he reminds us that after they finished singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives for prayer. But before they entered into the garden, Jesus gave them something to pray about. He told them that they would all fall away. Now, it's interesting that the Lord, 550 years earlier, predicted that this was going to happen. Uh, when he said through Zechariah to the exiles who returned in 520 to rebuild the temple in Zechariah 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, that the sheep may be scattered. Now, usually when you have a passage like this given by an Old Testament prophet, it, it has a reference to somebody you know, historically, but it appears as though, it almost, almost like it appears randomly in what uh, Zechariah is saying, and it turns out to be one of the clearest prophecies regarding the Messiah and what was going to happen to him. And Jesus was telling his disciples this was about to happen to them. Jesus was about to be struck down, by which he means he would be arrested, he'd be tried, he'd be condemned and crucified and his sheep would be scattered. When the soldiers would come out to make this arrest, his disciples would run for their lives. In other words, they would fall away. Now, Peter, at this particular moment, who always you know, had the tendency to be the most outspoken and oftentimes, you might say, put his foot in his mouth, he objected. He said, though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. 
Now Jesus went on to tell him not only that he would fall, but that before a rooster crowed, he would deny him three times, three times that he even knew him. Peter answered, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Now the rest of the disciples said the same thing. Now this is what I want us to think about for a moment, this, um, this confidence that Peter had. Okay? Peter said, though all may fall, I will never fall. Even though they take away my life, or if they, you know, if, if they threaten to kill me, or even if they do, I will never deny you. Now, the question is, where did that self-confidence that Peter had, where did it come from? You know, Luke tells us in his gospel that Jesus had earlier said to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Now, we know that he not only demanded this permission, but the Father had also granted it. Peter would be sifted, that is, he'd be tested. Um, one commentator of the language says that perhaps a more accurate way of looking at this would be that he would be winnowed to separate the good from the bad. Another analogy is he would be thrown into the crucible, you know, which would be heated up like uh, gold and the dross would rise to the surface. Satan was going to test him. He was going to tempt him. And the way that Satan began this sifting was by instilling in Peter, notice, a confidence that he would never fall away, that he would never deny him. Now, that confidence really led to two failures on Peter's part. First of all, because he was so self-assured, he didn't look to the Lord for the strength to resist that sin. He was looking to himself and to his own resources. And secondly, and this is perhaps, well, they're both important, but he didn't stay far enough away from the temptation that the devil would provide to cause him to fall. Because what did Peter do after all the disciples ran? By the way, that was his first failure. He had already fallen away from the Lord. Well, after Jesus was arrested, Peter followed him at a distance, and he entered into the courtyard of the house where Jesus was put on trial, and it was here that the devil would tempt him three times, with the result that Peter would fail three times. In other words, Peter put, placed himself in a place where he would be tempted to deny Jesus, even though he was warned ahead of time. But it was because Satan gave him the confidence that he would not fall, even if his life was at stake, and yet in the face of three bystanders, Jesus, excuse me, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus uh, three times. So here's a good example of the seventh lie the devil will use to get us to fall into sin. Others might not be able to resist the temptation, but you can. You know, you're strong. You're spiritually able. You're, or, or perhaps another way of putting this is you're safe. So even if you get near to it, even if you fall into it, you're, you're, you'll be fine. Okay, well, we know that that is not true. So Satan wants to convince us that we're spiritually strong. So strong that we don't have to be as concerned about, as others about temptations. We can get close to the fire, but not be burned. We can draw near to the edge, as it were, but not fall in. So Brooks, Brooks writes this in his description of this particular lie. Satan says this, You may walk by the harlot's door, but you won't go into the harlot's bed. You may sit and sup with the drunkard, but you won't be drunk with the drunkard. You may look upon Bathsheba's beauty, and you may play and toy with Delilah, but you won't commit wickedness with the one or the other. You may with Achan handle the golden wedge, but you won't steal the golden wedge. Now, Satan knows what Solomon wrote is true. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. And so Satan works to build up our confidence, to make us prideful in ourselves so that we take our eyes off the Lord and his warnings and we get too close to the temptations to do the things that are wrong. Okay, and we've already seen what happened in the case of Peter. 
And don't begin to think, as Brooks is telling us, that we're any better than Peter. So we need to know how to fortify ourselves against this. So what does Brooks counsel us to do? Well, first of all, and, and this is really going to be his main, his main um, argument, that we need to take seriously what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5.22. Abstain from every form of evil. And we're going to unpack that in just a moment. But he means by that we need to avoid, we need to keep ourselves free from every form, from every appearance of evil. Now, that particular statement can be understood in two different ways, and I think we often understand it in the first way, and we don't really pay attention to the second. So let me give you the first, first of all. First, what this means is that we should never appear to anyone else as though we are involved in anything sinful. We should never give the impression that we believe things that are sinful, things that are heretical. Uh, and I was trying to think of examples, you know, what, what could we, um, what we could do with this? Well, we don't want to give anyone the impression that we see the Bible as anything less than, than God's Word. We don't want to give the impression to anyone that we see Jesus as anything else than the God-man and not simply as a good teacher, as liberals believe, a, a, you know, a good moral teacher. We certainly don't want to give anyone the impression that we are justified by our works in any way but by faith alone. And that we don't need to repent of our sins and obey God's law, that's perhaps one of the biggest ones. Because people, if we identify as Christians, people are watching us all the time to see if we're going to live up to what we profess. And if we don't, they're just going to consider us hypocrites. Or as we saw last week in Finney, that we can become sinlessly perfect if we give anybody that impression and they see us fall, well, we're just going to cast dispersion on the gospel. Brooks writes this, whatever is heretical, unsound, and unsavory, shun it as you would do a serpent in your way, a snake, or poison in your food. He writes that Theodosius, and Theodosius was the fourth century Roman emperor who was instrumental in establishing the Nicene Creed. He says, Theodosius tore the Arians' arguments presented to him in writing because he found them repugnant to the Scriptures. That's interesting. There was a time when the Roman emperor was really concerned about the truth for one reason or another. And then he says Augustine, who was a great you know, church father of the 4th century, retracted in his, you know, his, his book of retractions even ironies. And ironies, that's where you express what you're trying to say is truth through words that mean the opposite. Okay? He retracted even ironies because they had the appearance of lying. So, first of all, shun any appearance of evil in the area of, of your beliefs or in your words. You want to make sure that you always present what you believe as the absolute truth and that that truth is true. Secondly, this applies to our conduct. We should never appear to others as though we're involved in any sin, in any idolatry. That's why Paul wrote what he did to the Corinthians, you know, as far as um, eating meat offered to idols, you know, don't eat it as meat offered to an idol, but eat it as one who has the freedom to eat whatever it is you would eat, knowing there is no such thing as an idol, and it's just purely uh, meat, okay? Uh, we should not give the impression that we're, of course, blaspheming the Lord by using His name inappropriately or that we're breaking the Sabbath or that we're being disobedient to the magistrate or that we're involved in sexual sin or that we're stealing. You know, obviously, the appearance, okay, this is the first thing. Avoid the appearance of these things. And this is just to name a few. Brooks writes, to abstain from all appearance of evil is to do nothing wherein sin appears or which has a shadow of sin. It was good counsel that Livia gave her husband Augustus, Augustus who was the emperor of Rome, quote, it behooves you not only not to do wrong, but not to seem to do so. If only Augustus would have 
taken her counsel. But that, that is what we are to do. We are to avoid any appearance of evil, either in belief or in practice. Now, that's the way I think we usually understand that passage, you know, avoid every appearance of evil. But the other way we can take what Paul says here, and perhaps what he actually does mean here, I think he actually means both, but, but I think this is the more important one. We should avoid getting close to anything that appears to be evil, okay, that seems evil, whether in doctrine or life. And again, think of all those examples I've already mentioned as far as embracing heretical beliefs, things that can destroy your soul, or doing things that we know are contrary to the law of God, things that are unloving and ungracious and actually hateful. Brooks says the closer we get to it, the closer we get to anything that even appears to be evil, the more likely we will be to fall into it. Brooks writes this, to venture upon the occasion of sin and then to pray, lead us not into temptation, is all one as to thrust your finger into the fire and then to pray that it might not be burnt. He also writes in Proverbs 4, 14 and 15, you have another command of Solomon. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. Now, he says this, the, the tr this triple gradation of Solomon shows with a great emphasis how necessary it is for men to flee from all appearance of sin as the seaman shuns rocks and shelves and as men shun those who have the plague sores running upon them. I, I think those illustrations, <laughs> they're, they're quite... Um, stark, picturesque, right? If you're, you know, if you're the captain of a ship, you're going to want to avoid the, uh, the shoals, you know, the shelves. And if you're walking on land, if you see somebody with oozing sores, you're, you're going to avoid them. But that's the way we should stay away from sin, okay? Now, he says this especially applies to the company that we keep. Friendship with wicked consorts is one of the strongest chains of hell and binds us to a participation in both their sin and their punishment. You know, one thing I think that's um, true about the Puritans is they don't, they don't mess around. They say things as pointedly, as frankly, as strongly as they can. And you know what? He's not exaggerating. And what he is saying, just the, the criticism was leveled against Jonathan Edwards that he really f tried to build up hell to be worse than it was. But there's no way that Jonathan Edwards could actually express hell as any worse than it is. As a matter of fact, he came far short of what it's really like. And if we really understood the, the, you know, the importance of these truths, then we would see that Brooks is understating what he is saying. We need to avoid sin. Okay, so that's his first point. Avoid not only the, you know, the, the appearance that you're involved in sin, but avoid everything that appears to be sin. Don't even get close to it. Now, secondly, Brooks reminds us that we're never going to overcome sin unless we turn from every opportunity that we have to sin. And I want you to see these, you know, these next two really follow on this one. But he writes this, God will not remove the temptation to sin except you turn from the occasion of sin. It is a just and righteous thing with God that he should fall into the pit who will dare to dance on the brink of the pit and that he should be a slave to sin that will not flee from the opportunities of sin. As long as there is fuel in our hearts for a temptation, we cannot be secure. He who has gunpowder around him had better keep far enough away from the sparks. To rush upon the opportunities of sin is both to tempt ourselves and to tempt Satan to tempt our souls. It is very rare that any soul plays with sin and is not ensnared by sin. Yeah, if you play with it, it's going it's to, you know, you're going to get caught in it. It's kind of like if you see the coiled snake and you decide you want to play with it, it's going to bite you. David, when he saw Bathsheba, gazed at Bathsheba, 
desired Bathsheba, took her to himself, and fell into adultery. Joseph, when he, well, when Potiphar's wife continued after him, he turned away from her every time. He looked to God, and he avoided falling into sin. So again, Brooks writes this, He who dares to approach sin is as he who would quench the fire with gasoline. Ah, souls, often remember how frequently you have been overcome by sin. When you, have got, when you have boldly gone upon the occasion of sin. Just think about the number of times you've played with it and fallen into it. If you want to keep from falling into sin, you need to avoid, stay away from the temptation to sin. Thirdly, he says, remember, this is what the saints who are now in heaven did. Again, he says, remember Joseph. We read in Genesis 39.10, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. Brooks writes, in this one temptation, you may see his fortitude, strength, his justice, how unjust it is, you know, to be with her, temperance and prudence or wisdom in that he shuns the occasion. For he would not so much as be with her. And what a man is indeed, that he is in a temptation, which is but a tap to give vent to corruption. You know, he's saying, you know, we, we, a temptation is just simply a nudge to basically let your sin go out in the, in the direction of that temptation. And sometimes that's all it takes. So he's reminding us that what we are under temptation is what we are in fact. Now he writes this, the devil knows that corrupt nature has a seed plot for all sin. He knows that, uh, you know, those that really don't know the Lord, that uh, they're like soil, which is ready to receive seed that's going to burst forth in different types of sin. He says, which being drawn forth and watered by some sinful occasion is soon set working to the producing of death and destruction. <coughs> God will not remove the temptation until we remove the occasion to temptation. I think he draws that analogy from the author to the Hebrews. You know, he talks about the land or the soil that receives the rain and produces all this thorns and thistles, and there's another one that produces good fruit. Well, the corrupt heart is the one that produces all these fruits of wickedness, but the gracious heart is the one that produces these fruits of righteousness. Well... We need to make sure that we are producing the fruits of righteousness. He writes this, the shunning, the occasions of sin, renders a man most like the godliness of men. A soul eminently gracious dares not come near the temptation. As Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? Instead of gazing at the temptation, what he says is we should be looking toward God. It is best and safest to have the eye always fixed upon the highest and noblest objects, as David writes. In, um, well, let's see, I, okay, I forget which psalm might be, Psalm 26. I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders, O Lord. I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. The highest and choicest examples are to some and should be to all, very quickening and provoking. And oh, that the examples of those worthy saints, David, Joseph, and Job, might prevail with all your souls to shun and avoid the occasions of sin. Everyone should strive to be like them in grace that desire to be equal with them in glory. He who shoots at the sun, though he be far short, will shoot higher than he who aims at a bush. It is best, and it speaks out much of Christ within, to eye the highest and the worthiest examples. So he says, you know, look, look at these examples. Who's your favorite character in the Bible, the most godly person you can think of? You know, who's your hero from church history? You know, those that you admire for their godliness and their zeal for the Lord. He says, aim for that. You know, don't, don't aim lower than that because the higher you aim, the higher you're going to attain. 
So we need to look to these examples and try to be provoked by them to pursue the same thing. And then finally he says this, avoiding opportunities to sin is an evidence of grace. Again, Brooks writes this, that a man is indeed what he is in temptation. He reminds us that temptations are sent to test us. And you know, when the Lord sends a temptation to test us, He's not doing that to show Him what we are, because He already knows. Rather, He sends the temptation to show us what we are, okay? And again, this is what Brooks writes, that a man is indeed what he is in temptation. And when sinful occasions present themselves before the soul, this speaks out both the truth and the strength of grace. When we, with Lot, can be chased in Sodom, and with Timothy, can live temperate in Asia among the luxurious Ephesians, and with Job, can walk uprightly in the land of Uz, where the people were profane in their lives and superstitious in their worship, and with Daniel, can be holy in Babylon, and with Abraham, righteous in Chaldea, etc. Many a wicked man is full of corruption, but doesn't show it because he lacks opportunity. But that man is surely godly, who in his behavior will not be bad, though tempted by opportunities to sin. Now, we do need to understand that Brooks is not saying here that a person who is truly gracious never sins, okay? But what he is saying is that if we have God's grace, we will practice righteousness. That, that'll be the character of our lives. We will be imperfect, but we will be moving in the right direction. It won't just be that every once in a while we do the right thing. We'll be doing the right thing most of the time. Every once in a while we're going to be falling, um, and of course imperfect all the time. But um, I think you get the point. Our lives will not be characterized by sin, but faithfulness to the Lord because we really love Him. And so what Brooks is saying is when Satan tries to get you to sin, by convincing you that you can play with the bait, you know, so to speak, play with the temptation without falling, you know, that you're stronger, you're better than others. Remember this, what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, he says, abstain Avoid, keep away from every form of evil. Secondly, that you need to turn from the opportunities that Satan presents you to sin if you are ever to overcome it. You can't keep playing with it. Thirdly, that this is what the saints who are now in heaven did. Again, just think Joseph. Don't, don't think David and Bathsheba, you know. That is not an example to follow. The example Joseph gave us is the one to follow, really the example of Christ. And then finally, remember that avoiding temptation is an evidence that you really do love the Lord, that you really do belong to Him. Well, may the Lord again give us grace to pursue these things because they're the right thing to do. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer. As we do, let's also prepare to come to the table Remembering again that our Lord Jesus Christ, in, uh, according to the author to the Hebrews, uh, resisted sin even to the point of shedding blood on the cross. That is what we are to shoot for, sinless perfection, though we will uh, fall short.